Hello, and welcome once again to the series on the web of life. Now, in the last session, we explored our food web through the systems view of life framework. For those of you who've been with us from the beginning, you might recollect that this framework was presented in the first session. Now today we're going to shift attention to open spaces and the environment in urban areas. They may be urban sprawls, you know, like Mumbai or the national capital region or most other big metros, or they could be cities and towns. Now open green spaces, tree-lined avenues, wide footpaths for people to walk on under the cool shade of these trees, shade under which people can sell their wares, rest and relax. Now this is a vision that many of us living in urban areas would like, isn't it? But what we're increasingly seeing is a struggle for space between people, flora and fauna, buildings, shopping malls, more and more vehicles. Yeah? People living in urban areas also have differing ideas of green spaces in a city. You know, for some, it's about manicured lawns, landscapes, paved yards. Others want flowering plants, trees that give them shade, fruit. And some want to protect and conserve the trees in open green spaces, which support diverse plants and other living creatures. And then, of course, there are those who want just some open space where they can get away from their congested life in cities. Now, economists predict that by 2050, about 64% of the developing world and 86% of the developed world will be urbanized. So in this session, what we're going to try and do is use the systems view of life framework to understand what this means for life in urban areas. How is the increasing role of technology in urbanization going to impact life? What about larger processes, such as global warming and climate change, and how is this going to impact and be impacted by urbanization? Now, it's well established that urban green spaces with trees and other vegetation provide us with several services, right? They're called ecosystem services. They trap air emissions from vehicles and industries. They hold the moisture in the soils through their root network, thereby helping to recharge the groundwater when it rains. They help to modify the microclimate of cities, and this is a very important one, because they cool the air around them. You know, modern urban areas are what are called urban heat islands. Now, why is that? See, we build our cities with concrete, steel, glass. Our roads are paved with asphalt or cement. All of this radiates heat, and that drives the temperature significantly higher in the cities compared to the surrounding areas. Vegetation, particularly trees, they help lower the temperature. And how do they do that? Through a process called transpiration, which I'm sure many of you are familiar. So what is transpiration? Water vapor from the plants is released through their leaves into the surrounding air, and that cools the surrounding air. Now, when urban green spaces are combined with water bodies, lakes, ponds, right? if you have enough urban green spaces and enough water bodies, there is an overall cooling effect in the cities, and that enhancement of the cooling effect affects the microclimate and therefore affects all of our lives. Now, these are some very immediate and direct effects on the environment of an urban area. Such spaces also meet several social and economic needs. You know, they offer spaces, like I was saying earlier, for people living in crowded, congested buildings and streets, a place to relax in, at least somewhere where they can breathe some fresh air and rest. Now, trees with large canopies, they also provide places for people to earn their livelihoods with some comfort. So they can sell their vegetables or fish or any other ware, you know, an assortment of things under the shade of trees. And you and I can also eat food and buy our vegetables and fish, etc., from these vendors in comfort. The research studies have shown us that these green spaces are very important for people's mental and emotional health something that we're realizing more and more during the periods of this lockdown. You know, in fact, vanishing green spaces are converting our urban areas into steel, concrete, glass, heat islands. And this is actually known to bring about a condition called nature deficit disorder. And this is a serious area of research, particularly in the context of children and young people who grow up in such cities. More on this, uh, please refer to some resources that are provided at the end of this video. Right? 
Now, when we cover our cities with paved surfaces, for example, we tile the footpaths, then spaces around office and commercial areas are all tiled, or our yards and gardens are tiled or cemented, we actually reduce the surfaces available for rainwater to percolate into the ground. And this is why we're running out of groundwater sources in our cities, because we're pulling out all the water at a rate that is faster than the rate at which the groundwater is getting recharged. And we're preventing this recharge by covering all our mud surfaces. Okay. The other thing also is that uh, apart from you know, uh, paving our surfaces, we are also removing tree cover because we want to build infrastructure. We are filling up water bodies because we want to release uh, real estate. And so by all of this, we prevent rainwater from being absorbed. So when we have torrential rains, right, and cities are beginning to experience floods, the water has nowhere to go and it stays in low-lying areas, in subways, etc. And that creates other health problems, public health issues, right? Okay, now let's shift slightly and go away from the services and utility for humans, right? And let's look at trees and plants as living beings. Let's look at their relationship with other life. You know, they are habitats for, for instance, you know, bigger plants and trees are habitats for creepers and vines. In their shade, small plants, grasses grow, which support a diversity of faunal life. Then they provide nesting space, they provide shelter for birds, they provide food for birds, insects, worms, small mammals, etc. So it's an ecosystem with a network of relationship. One thing to remember is that cities are not new. They have been in existence for several thousands of years. In fact, some of the earliest ones go back to almost 5,000 to 6,000 years ago. They have grown and developed on grasslands, forests, deserts, by reclaiming parts of the sea, right, along coastal areas. I mean, you take Bombay, you take Singapore. They have reclaimed parts of the sea to build the city and because of the growing population and the growing needs of the city. Now, native species of flora and fauna have either disappeared or some have adapted to the new habitats which have been created in parks, gardens, or even in the pores of stones and mud structures. In fact, in the crevices, nooks and crannies of buildings, roofs, windows of modern buildings, you find birds building nests there, right? So life actually continues to establish itself, whether it is manicured landscapes in the more affluent neighborhoods, ponds and lakes, or even overgrown vacant land, and sometimes, you know, discarded and abandoned houses, disused structures, stagnant pools of water in inner city and poorer neighborhoods. Now, take a walk around you, you know, wherever you live. Look on the road, on the walls, along the sides of the road, and stop and look at some plants, and you'll discover all manners of relationships there. Insects are present on and under leaves. Plants are finding their ways between cracks on walls, ants, bees, wasps, beetles, spiders, and then of course birds are there not far behind, right? So beyond this, right, there is a network of hidden connections that we don't see. And that's a fascinating new area of study. Trees communicate with each other through a fungal network in their root zone. It is present underground. This fungal network is called mycorrhiza. Now this network of relationships, right, between the fungi, between the soil, between the plant roots, it's being called the wood wide web. It's much more complex than the world wide web that's allowing us to communicate with each other, right? Now, recent studies have actually unearthed a very complex and alive communication network between trees. Now, take a look at this image of the root network. It really makes us think about what the implications are when we uproot trees or we plant a random assortment of trees near each other, or pave all around a tree without even considering the effect on the root network. If you look at this image, you'll see how, you know, the big tree is producing uh, food, right, through photosynthesis. And some of the uh, material that it produces, it exudes from the tree roots. It is taken up by the fungi for their own needs. And then the fungi allow a transportation of this food or communication to other plants which may not even be related to the tree, right? So there is fungi, there are different kinds of trees which are communicating with each other. 
In fact, there's a wonderful uh, piece of work that is being done and started actually by a Canadian researcher and a professor of forest ecology called Suzanne Simard. And she has done pioneering work in plant communication and intelligence. She's using this understanding of the network of relationships to see how forests can adapt to and recover from the impacts of deforestation and any other human activities, including climate change. And for more on this, um, you know, I've provided some resources below this video where you can uh, understand Suzanne Simard's work there. Now, in our cities and in our process of urbanization, it's really becoming clear, isn't it, that we need to not only create green species, a uh, sort of green spaces, but also protect and rejuvenate old trees, existing such spaces, which are their own ecosystem, right, which have their own interconnections, and they have evolved over time. So by just clearing these places, building something, and going and planting trees in another place, it doesn't solve or it doesn't serve the same purpose. We cannot recreate these interconnections that have supported life. So we really need to think about how we are building our cities. Now, so far, what we've done is we've just glimpsed some dimensions of the network of relationships. And even this glimpse gives us an understanding of the richness and complexity that emerges from a systems view and from a systemic view. Now, each urban area, of course, will have its own unique network of relationships and systemic characteristics, its culture, socio-ecological identity, economic and power relationships, right? Which is a function of where that city is located, its geography, its geology, its resources, how these resources have been shaped over the centuries. So the way we plan, the way we have planned our cities, you know, the choice of architectural styles, the building materials we've used, the choice of technologies, our economic priorities, right? Whether we want a city that is a trade center or whether we want a city that is a garden city, right? All that transformed the landscapes and people's lives. And this, in turn, has actually impacted the much larger earth processes. Because like we said before, all of this is energy dependent. And where do we get our energy from? By and large, coal, oil, gas. And all of this, when we use it to generate energy, releases carbon dioxide. So these need to be understood and considered as we go into the future. You know, a future of climate uncertainties, which will require flexibility to change the course in which we, um, in, in, in the ways particularly that we urbanize. You know, coastal cities will have challenges of rising sea levels from global warming. That will add pressure on water, on fresh water, on land, because you're going to lose more and more land to flooding and rising sea levels. Also, it's going to put a lot of pressure on energy and other material resources that are needed to sustain cities. I mean, if we are going into an increasingly urbanizing world, you know, the, the systemic approach is telling us that we really need to rethink this process of urbanization. And then extreme weather events, you know, such as excessive rainfall, they will bring with them flooding, disease, and public health crises. We are seeing it in all of our cities. Then we have to manage the rising temperatures, right? You remember we talked about the urban heat island, right? So if we recollect our last session also, where we talked about the food systems, we, there also we talked about the relationship of trees and forests with rainfall how they retain moisture, sequester carbon, and can contribute to reducing the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That was with respect to our food system. But we can connect that same understanding now to the role of trees, vegetation, and plants in urban areas as well. So like in the previous session, what is emerging is that it's about the choices we make as a society on how to live as countries, right? as nations, as the world, you know, how do we choose to live? What is the kind of lifestyle we are choosing? Thinking systemically about planning our urban areas as spaces for coexistence and symbiotic relationships with our environment is very necessary to adapt to the future changes that we just talked about. You know, this planning process and this thinking process, it must recognize that there is no one way to think about urbanization. But 
it must emerge from the unique identity of the city. Because you have tropical cities, you have temperate cities, you have desert cities. So you can't plan all of them in the same way. There is no one size fits all. It must emerge from the unique identity of the city, which rests on these socio-ecological relationships. Now, as we draw to the end of the session, I would like to leave you with a glimpse into an emerging world and a fascinating area of study. How urbanization and cities are driving evolutionary processes of living species. The Dutch evolutionary biologist, Menno Schildhoitzen, he actually discusses some of the recent research in this area in his book, Darwin Comes to Town. And here is one quote from it that I think would be a very good thing for us to remember. Evolution is not only the stuff of dinosaurs and geological epochs. It can actually be observed here and now. The notion that our impact on the environment is so great that wild animals and plants are actually adapting to habitats that were originally created by humans for humans. That makes us aware that some of the changes we are enforcing on the earth are irreversible. So really something to think about in this context of urbanization. Okay, so now let's you know summarize and see what we can take away from this session. One is that a systemic view of the urban landscape reveals to us that it is shaped by an interplay of ecological, social, political, cultural, and economic factors. Green spaces, vegetation, flora, fauna, whatever we call them, and their interdependencies are very intricate and often not perceived by people. Patterns of urbanization, you know how we choose to urbanize, they shape the biodiversity in these urban landscapes and the future of many of these species and of life. The third point to take away is that a systemic understanding of these relationships and how human activities impact them is important. In finding ways by which we can minimize and mitigate the damage due to these impacts. You know, we're slowly understanding the complex communication networks, such as the wood wide web. And in a climate uncertain future, urbanization processes can be shaped to support and sustain all life by drawing on the systemic understanding of life. Thank you.